Good morning. Bom dia. <laughs> I'm not going to preach in Portuguese. I'm going to. <laughs> it's interesting as we were, um, Dora and I have been sharing that these basically are our thoughts, not just my thoughts. And uh, so we've been sharing during the week, uh, what, um, sensing what the Holy Spirit would have us share. And uh, I have notes. But as we were driving along here, just as we came past Keele University, I felt the Holy Spirit say, change your notes. It's not a good thing, you know, when you're about to preach and the Holy Spirit says, do something different. Not the whole thing, but the beginning of it. As Martin said, um, many years ago, even before we went to America, God has spoken to Dora and I about establishing a house of prayer, which was good. But the fact is, I didn't like prayer meetings. And um, I didn't consider myself to be a, a good prayer. You know, if I set my heart to pray for an hour, I'd pray for five minutes and think, well, what else am I going to say? Even though we may have prayer lists, you know, it's, um, it's a challenge to be in that uh, continual place of prayer. And then I read a verse in um, Scripture, it's Isaiah 56, verse 7, and it says that God will make them joyful in the house of prayer. And I thought, joyful in the house of prayer? And I'd grown up seeing the older people gather for the prayer group or the prayer meetings and think, that's not really for me. Now we're the older people. But it was a challenge to get that sense of why. What's joyful about being in the place of prayer? And I began to realize that really the Holy Spirit needed to do something in me to take on that assignment of being in the place of prayer, in the house of prayer. And, I, and we'd looked at scriptures obviously before, but just some scriptures we'll share with you this morning. And, and Martin said, why pray? Well, um, I began to look at the strip. If, look, if we looked in the Gospels, in Luke's Gospel, um, chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. And in Luke 6, verse 12, he says, On one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the whole night praying. Luke 9, verse 26, Jesus took Peter, John, and James with him onto a mountain to pray. It's like Scripture sort of sets the pattern that Jesus had to pray. And I felt this sort of, well, if Jesus had this pattern of prayer and felt that he needed to pray and communicate with the Father, then surely I should be set in, in, in my lifestyle to do a similar thing. See, Jesus, for Jesus, this prayer wasn't a discipline or a duty. It was about relationship. That's what I began to learn. It was a lifestyle. It was a joy. He delighted in spending time with the Father. Luke chapter 11 Verse 1, it says, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, many of us, I'm sure, have read this scripture over and over again. It's interesting, the disciples had traveled for probably three years with Jesus, walking with him, talking with him, seeing what he was doing, relating to him, seeing him turn water into wine, healed many people, the blind seeing, the lame leaping and walking, seeing him feed, feed thousands of people with a little boy's lunch, seeing him walk on water. I wonder if I'd have been in that position, whether the question I would have asked is, Lord, teach us to pray. I would have been thinking about some of those things and saying, Lord, how did you do that? How did you walk on water? It looked a bit scary, but it was cool. How did you raise Lazarus from the dead? those sort of questions we read about and stories we read about in the Gospels and think, Jesus did all that, and yet the disciples came to a point after seeing all that things, all the things that Jesus had done, they said, Lord, would you teach us to pray? 
The disciples seem to have made the connection between his public life, his his miracles, the times he spent with the Father to pray. I believe the disciples have begun to see that which enabled Jesus to be 100% successful in his ministry. John 5, 19 says, Very truly I tell you, the Son of God did nothing of himself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son does. See, it's all about prayer. It's all about relationship. It's all about time spent with the Father. What was Jesus doing when he went away to those solitary places, the quiet places on a mountainside, or spending the night in prayer? What was he doing when he would come away to pray? What was he saying as he began to to relate to the Father on those occasions? I let my imagination sort of work a bit in situations like this when I read these stories and these uh, things from the, uh, from the Gospels. What was he saying? Father, I love you. I really love you. There's no one like you. No one like you. You're a good, good God. Full of grace, full of kindness. You know what? In verses later, it speaks about how Jesus taught them to pray. And the first thing it says, Hallowed be thy name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I believe when Jesus came before the Father, he would begin by hallowing the name of Jesus, the Father, lifting up the name of the Father. And then I believe we used to sing a song. Recognizing my age a bit, but we used to sing a song in church. Um, Father, we worship you and adore you. That's, the, I believe, what Jesus was doing in the initial times that he spent with prayer. But I believe he would say, Father, what's on your heart? What is your heartbeat? What is it you want to show me? What is it you want to tell me? Because I want to walk in that which you tell me. I want to do in that which you tell me to do. See, prayer is not just about speaking and talking, is it? It's listening as well. I believe Jesus listened more probably than what he spoke to the Father. Longing to know the Father's heart. Longing to know what the Father was doing. Longing to know what the Father was seeing. I want to be a bit like that in my prayer life, wanting to know what the Father is saying and doing. See, God is wanting the same relationship from us that he had with Jesus. He wants us to come into that place of relationship and intimacy before him, relating to him. And we might think, well, you know, Jesus was that the love of the Father's heart. He really loves him. John 15 verse 9 says, Jesus is saying, As the Father loved me, so I have loved you. What's he saying? As the Father loved me, I have loved you. It's the same love. Jesus declares that he loves you in to the same degree that the Father loves him. The same degree with intensity. We can't imagine that somehow, can we? But it is the same love. It's the same love and it's perfect love. God's love doesn't change. He doesn't love one more than another. His love is perfect. He loves us all in the same way way to the same degree and the same intensity that the Father loved him. I used to struggle to believe that and know that and to be able to walk in relationship like that. I've asked myself and asked myself in the past and sometimes still I ask myself, how could it be that God the Father the creator of the universe is waiting and listening for me to speak to him. How could it be 
that God, the creator of all things, is longing to hear my voice and longing to me to relate to him in that measure. See, when we come away to pray and spend time with the Father, it's like the Father saying, here's one that I love. Here's one that I want to hear from. Here's one that wants to grab my heartbeat. He's waiting to hear our voice. We see, we have to um, get our thinking in line with the heart, Father heart of God and how he sees us. I quote, we must accurately perceive how God thinks about us in our weakness. He's a God of unending kindness. His mercy is not challenged by our lack. The Jesus could be filled with love and enjoyment when someone has, when some is still stumbling and immature and seems unrighteous or unjust to our false understandings of God himself. We imagine that kind of affection is possible only when we are fully pure, holy and mature. Yet the glorious good news of all times that Jesus, the perfect one, has set his affections on those who are weak and undeserving. While we are still his enemies, God died, he died for us, and while we are yet immature, he enjoys us. It isn't to say that he enjoys all the things we do, or the failures we have, but he delights in the lover of God, who is yet on a journey being changed from glory to glory. We are weaker than we realize, but also lovelier than we realize. Yet God perceives us in us more beauty than we can imagine. Our loveliness is not an attribute gained by our attainments. It's a gift of God. He sees us beautiful of what Jesus himself has accomplished in our salvation and transformation. This divine perspective is our source of protection from the accusations of the enemy. When the accuser seeks to poison me with ac accusation regarding my weakness and immaturity, I respond with the truth that Jesus delights in me even in my weakness. We used to sing a song, I am covered over with a robe of righteousness that Jesus gives to me. When he looks at me, he sees not what I used to be, but he sees Jesus. See, when we pray, God's not looking for a list of information. He's looking for a conversation. He's wanting to have relationship and friendship with you and I. What a wonder. God's not looking for perfect prayers. No prayer is too small. You don't have to use eloquent speech. So one of the prayers I've prayed over years and years is, Help! or I don't know what to pray. Romans 8 verse 26 says, the Holy Spirit helps us praying in the Spirit. Our private times of prayer, our public meetings may not move us, but they move the angels. And more importantly, they move the heart of God. Never measure your prayers by what you feel when we pray in agreement with God's will, our weak prayers move the heart of God, even though they do not move our, us. God's response to Cornelius, um, <coughs> excuse me, when Cornelius was praying, an angel suddenly appeared to him with a message from God, telling him his prayers would be remembered forever. Every prayer you have prayed is remembered in heaven. When Martin says, why pray? That's the thought that was going through our minds as we were putting these thoughts together. When we perceive how God sees us, we can confidently come before him in prayer. God has chosen us to partner with him. Amen? Chosen us to partner with him so that we might see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven.
Prayer changes things. This power in prayer. In the scripture that Jess read to us, this is story of the widow who kept on coming before the unrighteous, just persisting over and over again for justice. Sometimes our prayers aren't answered instantly. Do you wish they were? Sometimes we wish you they were. Sometimes we have to wait for the answer to come. And, but we have to press in and keep on praying, keep on seeking the face of God. One of the things Martin asked us to do as we shared this morning was to share some testimonies or stories. And Joy and I have been in ministry for many, many years and we could share many, many stories of answered prayer. But there's one or two things that have stood out over the years and we've seen God answer prayers and we are thankful for that. And we still press in. Um, I'll share a testimony which relates right up to today of things that we've prayed for. Back in um, many years ago, Dory and I were um, pastoring a congregation down in the south of England, and it was a time, now probably many of you don't remember this at all because you're too young, but we remember it vividly. Back in the days, anybody remember punk rockers? Oh, one or two. <laughs> Punk rockers were the, were the, the young people that had uh, mohawk hairstyles of all shapes and sizes and chains hanging from their noses and chains hanging from their ears and linked up with safety pins and all sorts of things. But this was way back in the town we were pastoring in, there were gangs of these young people, punk rockers, um, around the town and the police were having issues dealing with them. And um, if, if there was any protests happening, they would be there. I don't think they knew all the time what they were protesting, but they would be there protesting because they were standing up for what is, they felt was right or whatever. Quite radical, actually. Um, but as I was sharing one Sunday morning in church, and I was speaking about how we as a community can relate to the community that we live in and how we can reach them, and I said, what would happen if six punk rockers walked in here and sat on the back row? And everybody sort of giggled and laughed a bit. And following Sunday, we were up leading worship, and six punk rockers walked in and sat on the back row. And then I thought, Lord, what are we going to do? There was a young couple in, uh, there were leaders in our congregation, part of our leadership team, and they began, began to relate to these young people. And we, we didn't have a sanctuary where we worshipped him back then, but we had a, um, a restaurant in the town which we used for our midweek gatherings and everything. And over the next few weeks, a hundred punk rockers came to our coffee shop, our restaurant, every Friday night. And um, just began to relate, talk, find out what they were doing. I'd like to tell you that all those punk rockers made a decision and came to Jesus. It wasn't the case. But there were a handful that surrendered their lives to Jesus and totally transformed their lifestyle. And we didn't tell them, you can't dress like that, you can't do that anymore. We just lived out the example of the lives we were living. It was interesting to see this handful of young people that began to change and see their lives transformed, even in the way they looked. And we weren't saying, don't dress like that, don't look like that anymore. God's looking at the inside the hearts but because god began to transform on the inside they began to change on the outside god answered our prayers in a way that we would never have thought happened as martin said when we were in america we um, established a house of prayer ministry and part of the years that we were doing that we were um, renting a property in the downtown area, I should say the city centre of the area, um, and it was a shop front, so that the whole front was a glass wall. And so people could look into the prayer room and see what was happening. And I'm sure some of them had um, some strange feeling as they saw these people, maybe hands in the air, or people kneeling on the floor, or people laid out on the floor, 
uh, worshipping and crying out to God. But the fact is they could walk in or out if they wanted to. And um, one day we were in the prayer room and this young guy came in, looked the worst for wear, his mind was a bit messed up, and he asked if I would pray for him. He looked as though he'd been living on the street, and um, his life was obviously messed up somewhat. And I just began to pray for him and ask that the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit would move in his life and that God would transform him and change him. Some months later, I was preaching in one of the congregations in the town and a young guy came up to me after the meeting and he said, do you remember me? And I didn't, because here was a young man who was obviously in his right mind, looking good, looking fit, looking great. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't remember you. He said, well, I came into your prayer room. And you prayed for me. And God transformed my life. There's power in prayer. Prayer changes things. A long time ago, Dor Dory and I were in, doing outreach in, on the streets of London. And we were working with an Anglican church, interestingly enough. And we were in the church hall, which had a basement. And we would open the, the, the place at about midnight and go into the early hours of the, the morning because that's when all the people, the street people are and whatever, you know, coming out of clubs and pubs. And um, there was this young, youngish guy um, came in and he, he was obviously drunk. He got a, a bottle in each hand and he, ca he came and sat right on the front seat where a friend of ours was speaking and sharing the gospel. And obviously it became apparent to everybody this guy was just out of it and some of the team brought him back down into the basement which is where we were praying with people and Dorian and I were praying with um, a young lady who actually was one of the stars of um, one of the ice shows that have in America here I forget but we were sat praying with her and, and the guys brought this guy down sat him at the table to try to calm him down and they be began to pray with him and I've only seen this once in my life. As they began to pray with him, he instantly sobered. Instantly sobered up. It turns out he had been a Pentecostal pastor whose daughter was killed in an auto accident and he totally lost it. His wife left him and he just took to drink. They took him way down. But God transformed his life that night. Completely turned his life around. The power of prayer. Prayer changes things. You know, we sing that song, don't we? Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. We sing it, but the reality, that's who he is. That's who he is. Back in America again, in the town where we were, had the house of prayer, we worked with a number of local churches and local pastors. And there's one congregation who, um, for some reason, their numbers were beginning to drop. And um, I prayed with this guy every, I prayed with this, this pastor um, every week, had breakfast with him, prayed with him just for 20 years. And, I, and he said, I'm, we're going to make a commitment to pray. And they pray Wednesday evening 
they pray Saturday morning and they pray probably a half an hour before the service starts on Sunday. And he was telling me just, I speak to him once, about once every month, he was telling me um, last time I spoke to him, I said, how's the church going? He said, it's interesting. He said, we nearly doubled our size. We nearly doubled the amount of people. And he said, it's all new growth. It's unchurched people. The power of prayer transforms and changes. Amen. In 1998, during the night did a prayer walk across New York State, it's about just over 340 mi miles. We didn't do it in one day. <laughs> took us about, it took us the month of May, about 30 days. And I, God, had, God had clearly directed us to do this. And the, the, um, the goal of the prayer walk was to encourage leaders and um, believers as we walked through their town to really cry out for a spiritual awakening and revival and for God to move in their town. And um, I think it was in the first four days of the week we got to this um, town, it's a place called Baptavia in western New York State. And we would generally spend the night in a town and then move on to the next place. Um, but for reasons that I won't go into, it would take too, too much time to tell you the reasons. Um, we end up staying in that town, in a church park, a car park, from four nights. And um, it was interesting, God began to show us some things. And then we moved on and um, we still pray for that, we still pray for New York and we still pray for that state. And uh, this was 1998 and we've been praying for this, to have for God to move in this place. Since we've been back in the UK, in, in 2021, on the same site that we camped out for four nights, 1,200 pastors gathered in Utah to pray for revival and awakening. And they had this evangelist come in with a 3,000 seater tent and just holding nightly meetings. And hundreds of people got saved. Hundreds of people surrendered their lives to Jesus. Hallelujah. The exciting thing is that that evangelist is going back to that town tonight. They're holding revival services tonight, tonight US time. God's transformed that place. And we, we saw throughout that time of that prayer walk how God began to move in certain places, in certain towns, churches being planted all over the place. Was that because we prayed? No. I believe it's because we were part of a group of people and believers who were praying to see those sort of things happen. Exciting. There's never a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that it did not begin without prayer. And very often a small group of prayer, prayers But God can change things even with a small group of prayer, prayers. I like to see when whole congregations get a heart to pray for their community. We were in America many years ago, up in Portland, Oregon, on the west coast there. We were ministering in a church there and we got there before the, the meeting was due to start and the people who were hosting us in their home said, would you like to go to the, just to the prayer meeting before the service? And we said, sure, we'd like to go to the prayer meeting. And we got to the, got to the village, we, there was about 3,000 seat of sanctuary, we walked through the sanctuary and they led us out to this, what I guess used to be their sanctuary, but was far smaller. And when we opened the doors, there were 600 people at the prayer meeting. And it was just a noise of prayer. Just a noise of prayer. I've never forgotten it. A noise of prayer. I don't think it matters whether there's 600 or 60 or even six people. 
God is the one who changes things. God is the one who transforms things. But he's listening for our heart. He's listening for our voice. Amen? What does the enemy do when we pray? Have you ever thought of that? What's the enemy doing when we pray? I was reading somewhere quite recently and somebody was interviewing um, this person, I think there was more than one, but this person who used to be a Satan worshipper, part of the Satanic Church. And they asked them the question, um, what happens when people pray? And this person said, we see this significant response we do our best to discourage it at all costs. This is prayer they're talking about. This is what the enemy, the accuser, is causing to happen. We fear churches and Christians who pray in tongues. We are able, we are, this is the people, Satan worshippers. We are able to see in the spirit realm, when they pray in the spirit, we see an increase of angelic activity. Angels dart across the sky on divine assignments. Whoa! God is longing for us to hear our voice. He's, he's longing for us to take time, set aside, not to use all the time to talk to him, but to use time to listen to him. Because he's longing to speak to us. He's longing for us to know his heartbeat. He's longing for us to see what he's doing. You know, next Sunday night, we'll gather together back there for encounter. We come together to worship, to praise, to wait on God, to pray but to wait on God. Why do we do that? Partly because like Jesus, we love him. We want to tell him how much we love him, that he's a good, good God. But also because we want to hear, God, what are you saying? What are you saying to me? What are you saying to our congregation? What are you saying for the city in which we live? What are, just, what are we saying to the nation we, which, in which we live? We don't, we don't have to look far to know what's going on in the world, whether it's TV newsreels or whatever. When you see what's going on, I think somehow the spirit of stupid has been let loose in where we live. Do you know what I mean? It's crazy, but God can transform it. He can renew it. But it's prayer that changes things. Let's just pray. Matthew 21 verse 12 says, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. When I read that verse, I think, God, what were you trying to do? What was Jesus saying? See, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Within that temple, I believe, is a place for us to be crying out to the Father. A place of prayer. It's like a house of prayer within us. And in that scripture, I think Jesus was saying, you need to, you need to get rid of the clutter. Martin was speaking to us in the last couple of weeks. 
things that we need to get moved out of our lives. To get the clutter out of our lives. To get the clutter out of our spiritual walk with Jesus. Father, I pray that you would cause us to be a people who are hungering after you. Who are seeking to know your hearts, to know your heartbeats. Holy Spirit, would you help us in our weakness? Would you strengthen us to a people, be a people who are longing to hear the Father heart. God, we choose to partner with you. We choose to see what you're doing. We choose to know what you're saying. We're longing, Father, that your kingdom, as it is in heaven, would be here on earth. And so we choose to partner with you. We love you. Father, we thank you because you love us more than we can ever comprehend. That love is deeper, wider, far greater than we can imagine. And Father, I pray that you will give the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of who you are, that we would see how much you love us. When Jesus said, as you have loved him, he loves us to the same degree, the same intensity, with the same passion. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.